Hi, hello again to my high school students. This is Macbeth week in our high school class. Um, I meant to mention in the last lecture, and I think I forgot. If I didn't forget, you're going to hear it again. Macbeth, the play Macbeth is based on an actual person. In the uh, 1000s in England, uh, before the Norman conquest of England. All right. There was in Scotland a ruler named Malcolm, and Malcolm was a pretty firm ruler. He died in his son Duncan, who should sound very familiar to you by now. Duncan took over. Duncan was not such a good ruler. The noblemen of Scotland were not fond of him. They didn't like him, and they banded together, and one of them with the backing of the others, a man named Macbethad, got rid of Duncan, took over the rule. It was not, it, it was not um, ambition motivated as far as we know. It was more the fact that Duncan was not the sweet, kind ruler uh, that he is portrayed as in the play Macbeth. And, uh, and the, the noblemen all together decided they wanted a change of rule. Now, Shakespeare took that actual story and changed it. Uh, this is not one of Shakespeare's history plays, even though this is based on a historical person, because he wanted to portray Macbeth in a certain way, as a certain character, for a certain reason. We talked about last week that in tragedies, in Shakespearean tragedies particularly, there's often a flaw in the character, a, a tragic flaw, they call it, something about that character that leads him down a path that leads to a tragic end. So as we talk about Macbeth today, we're going to be talking about what there is in his character that maybe leads him down the path he follows. But last week I told you that we are going to write a paper. Our final paper is on the topic of should Macbeth have listened to the witches? Now this might seem a an obvious answer. No, he shouldn't have because they led him to a bad end. But I said listened to them, not obeyed them. And then after I said obeyed, I realized the the witches never really tell Macbeth to do anything. Did you notice that? They give him information, but they don't actually tell him to do anything. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to get your A and I charts and a pen or a pencil. And I, we're gonna add to, because I'm guessing, I, I'm hoping you got some good information. But if you feel like it's a little sparse, I'm gonna help you. I did my own ANI chart. So I'm going to give you what I came up with. Also, on the comments below the video, perhaps you would be willing to share some of yours with the group. So you'll have access to your own. You'll have access to all the ones I give you here. But perhaps you could share yours with other people so that we all remember we, it's OK to borrow from each other. It's not a problem. So instead of writing these all out on the whiteboard, I feel like I really don't need to do that necessarily. You can always pause the video and write these down to keep up with me. But here's some of the A's I came up with, the affirmatives. Yes, Macbeth should listen to the witches. I'm also going to be stipping my tea today because my throat's a little scratchy. Okay. A, number one, they told the truth. They did actually tell him the truth. In this sense, they seem to be true prophets. Remember in the Bible, the test of a prophecy is if their prophecies come true. If they don't come true, they're false prophets. In that sense, they do give prophecies. Um, you know, Thane of Cawdor, King. So they tell true things. My second one is, they could help him advance. You probably have noticed that Macbeth seems to be ambitious. He likes to get ahead in the world. And the witches could help him do that. 
you know, it would be very helpful to know what's going to happen, wouldn't it? You might be able to use that to your advantage. So uh, they might give him valuable advice and information about current affairs that might help him get ahead. My next A is something that I already mentioned to you. They don't actually tell him to do anything. They give him statements of fact or prophecy, but they don't actually give him advice about what to do. So technically, he could listen to them and use their statements and then decide how to act on them. And he could have decided to act in a different way than he did act. You know, knowing what will happen helps you prepare for the future. And this is my next A. Um, knowing that Banquo's family are going to be kings, you know, you could choose, <clears throat> he chose to kill Banquo, which didn't do any good because he didn't kill Fleance. But uh, instead, he could have chosen to uh, use that to his advantage by um, taking Banco into his confidence and cultivating that relationship. If this is where the kingship lies in the future, maybe you want to use that information to your advantage. My next A is Macbeth really didn't know all the weird stuff I put they were doing and brewing. All right, we see things happening with the witches that Macbeth doesn't see. So from Macbeth's point of view, he doesn't know necessarily that they're evil. We're gonna talk about the play um, scene by scene here in a moment. I'm gonna go through it with you. But you know, scenes like when they're brewing some potion, they're gonna um, go punish a ship captain because his wife wouldn't give her the witch roasted chestnuts. So they're going to go punish him by making him not be able to sleep. Um, and, they're, and they're brewing some pretty weird stuff. They've got dead baby thumbs and all sorts of nastiness that they're brewing in their pot. Um, double, double, toil and trouble. Uh, Macbeth doesn't know any of that. He's not privy to what they're doing. So as far as he knows, they're just people who know something about what's going on. They maybe know something about the future and he might be able to use them. Um, you know, you could argue that even with what Macbeth did, his wife is more responsible than the witches. We'll talk about that when we talk about the play. But, but you could say, well, his, his wife is the one who pushed him to do things. The witches didn't push him to do anything. They just gave him information. And in that, in that sense, they're neutral. Uh, it's not Macbeth's fault. They keep appearing and the witches are almost harassing him. They keep waylaying him as he's just passing through. Now, what, later on in the play, he does go seek them out. But at first, they're just there. So they just presented themselves. Why not give them a hearing? Why not at least hear them out? Uh, Banquo heard the witches and listened to them, but he stayed a good guy, right? He, they gave him encouraging news. He was thinking, well, you know, that's great. So my descendants are going to be kings. Sounds good. But I'm not totally sure I'm going to do anything about that. So in Banquo's case, case, listening to the witches did not lead to any wrongdoing. Um, Macbeth could have used the witches' advice, which used their information, to advise the king and bring honors on himself. They could have been used for good, in other words. But he didn't. But that doesn't mean he couldn't have, that he couldn't have listened to them. So those are the A's that I came up with. Yes, Macbeth should listen to the witches. If you've got more that I didn't think of, please share them by putting them in the comments below the video because I'm sure everyone would really love to hear what you came up with. I would love to hear what you came up with because it's kind of a hard side to defend. Okay, here are my ends. I don't have any eyes for you. 
And honestly, the, the point of the interesting category is to eventually file them into an A or an N anyway. But if you have some I's, you can share those. But here's my N's. They are quite possibly demonic powers. Okay, they're <clears throat> living out in the middle of nowhere, um, dressed kind of shabbily. They're women, but they have beards. And who, who dances around in the middle of nowhere and knows the future? Banquo even comments on this. So Macbeth has, has considered this possibility. Banquo says, D can the devil speak true? So Macbeth should be wary because they are potentially forces of evil. Um, they're fruits. They led to murder. Okay, it says, by their fruits you shall know them. In the Bible, the fruit of listening to the witches in this case was murder. So therefore, he should not listen to them. Um, I, I mentioned this, this kind of goes on, along with my first point. They are obviously fishy. They only appear to Macbeth alone or just him and Banquo. If you don't have anything to hide, you, you make yourself public. They're hiding out. They've got something to hide. Okay. They only appear in very out of the way places. We know that they're up to no good. They want to they wanna attack that ship captain. They brew very questionable potions with very questionably acquired ingredients. So these are all reasons that they're, we pretty much know they're up to no good and you should not listen to them. Another reason is they randomly disappear. Anything that randomly disappears, well, I don't know. I suppose angels could randomly disappear. I suppose in and of itself, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But he's right in the middle of asking them questions sometimes and they just disappear. I, f I feel like that should clue him in that there's something wrong here. Um, they uh, produce bad fruit. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, you know, by their fruits, you will know them. Um, the rivalry with Banquo. Not only do they lead to murder, but they, they also um, turn him against his best friend. Okay, no offense, but whenever you see an ugly woman with a boiling pot, I feel like that should scream out witch to you and you should run the other way. No, I don't mean to be mean to ugly women, but... Ugly women plus boiling pot out in the middle of nowhere equals witch. Don't listen. Okay. And the last reason I have is um, <clears throat> Macbeth didn't necessarily know that, but we know that. They give incomplete truths, don't they? They don't give all the details. So whenever you don't tell the whole truth, it's a bit like lying, isn't it? It's misleading. And as we go through the play here together, we're going to look at some ways that the witches mislead Macbeth. All right, so that's what I got for ins. If you have more ins that I did not have, please, like I said, share them. Share them with the rest of us in the comments below the video so that I can know some of the ones you came up with and your classmates can know some of the ones you came up with in order to help you to uh, write the paper more easily. This week you are doing um, the outline. Um, I think we're just going to stick with the outline. I don't think we're going to add a new element. All right. So you second year people, um, please go ahead and just do the, the full outline like we just did with the most recent paper, the first essay in book two including the um, elocution. I guess we're just doing the, the outline, so we're not including elocution this week. So just use the, uh, the full persuasive essay outline. And for you first year students, let's just once again do the same outline that we've done 
I'm not going to add since we're just at the end of the school year, this is the last paper you're doing for me. And because we can't be live together and you can't get as much feedback, it's a little more difficult to do it like this. Let's just stick with the outline we, we've done previously. We are going to add a new elocution element just for fun, but let's keep the same outline. Okay. If you have any questions on that, please call me or email me. But otherwise, uh, since we just did one of these, this should make it um, easy since we've just reviewed it. Okay, <clears throat> let's move on to the play Macbeth. I've got my copy here in front of me and let's just look through it together. And I hope that the plot uh, is pretty obvious to you. It's not really very hard to follow. Most of the language in Macbeth really isn't that hard to follow, I think. But I want to point out some things as we go through it together and just point out some of the thing, the uh, language that might have been hard to follow. In Act 1, Scene 1, we meet the witches. They are called witches. And they say some odd things right off the bat. The first witch asks, when shall we three meet again, in thunder, lightning, or in rain? The second witch answers, when the hurly-burly's done. Hurly-burly is like a big tumult. When the battle's lost and won. They, what does that mean? When the battle's lost and won. Well, we're going to find out there is a battle going on, and it's going to be won. But how is the battle lost? And what does that mean to speak in opposites and contradictions like that? We'll explore that again in, um, in a moment. And they decide they're going to meet upon the heath to meet Macbeth. And they call to Gramelkin, Gray Malkin and Paddock. These are their familiar animals. Witches were thought to have some sort of animal that was their, not a pet, but a familiar spirit that helped them do their potions. Okay? And then they say at the end of this, fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filthy air. Again, opposites. So they take things and turn them upside down. Battles lost and won. Fair is foul and foul is fair. They're queens of double talk. We'll see that again in a little while. Right after that, we see a battle scene. King Duncan is there with some of his, uh, with his sons, Malcolm and Donalbane, and also some of his attendants and, and, and um, captains. And a man comes in, a captain, and the first thing we see, hear Duncan say is, what bloody man is that? Because he's come out of the battle and he's bloody. But he's also going to come and describe Macbeth. He's going to describe another bloody man. And the first time we meet Macbeth in this play, He's being described by a bloody man, and his bloody deeds are being described. Because they're at battle right now with Macdonwald. He's rebelled against the king. And these are forces of the king that are putting down the rebellion. And number one guy is Macbeth. And it says um, in line 18, for brave Macbeth, well, he deserves that name. Disdaining fortune with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution, like valor's minion, carved out his passage till he faced the slave, the rebel, which never shook hands nor bade farewell to him till he unseamed him from the knave to the chops. He sliced his whole guts up and fixed his head upon our battlements. This is the first thing we see Macbeth doing killing. Now he's killing in defense of the king, but he's a bloody man. Then um, more, more attendants come, more army men come, and they report to Duncan that the man who was the Thane of Cawdor, a Thane is like a duke, an earl, a nobleman, that he had aligned himself with the traitors. He was a traitor. And uh, that they've brought him down. And Duncan says, 
Great. No more that thane of Cawdor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go now, pro pronounce his present death, and with his former title, greet Macbeth. Go execute him for treason, and tell Macbeth he gets all his stuff. He's thane of Cawdor. Right. Then we move back to the witches, and this is where we meet um, them planning to uh, harass a ship's captain because his wife would not give her chestnuts. And Macbeth comes along. And notice, um, just as Macbeth and Banquo enter the scene, okay, this is the very first words, the very first words we hear Macbeth say. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. He's already speaking like the witches. Now, it's a fair day because they've won the battle. Maybe it's a foul day because the weather is bad. Maybe it's foul because so many good men have died, including the Thane of Cawdor has been, you know, found out to be a traitor. Whatever he means by that, he's saying things that the witches say. He's already speaking their language. He's already in their mindset. Remember that. He's already like them, and he hasn't met them yet. So they see these women. Banquo says, what are these who so withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are on it? Live you? Are you alive? Or are you aught that man may question? You seem to understand me by each at once laying her choppy finger upon her skinny lips. You should be women, and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. You look like women, but you got beards. It's kind of weird. All right. And the witches speak, but they don't speak to Banquo. They say, all hail Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Gloms. That's what he already is. All hail Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor. Wait a minute, there is already a Thane of Cawdor, as far as Macbeth knows. All hail Macbeth that shall be king hereafter. And apparently, Macbeth has a strange, startling reaction, because Banquo says, Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? Well, isn't that good news? Like being greeted with all sorts of titles and you're going to be king someday? Isn't that good? We're going to find out why Macbeth starts, so, as Banquo says. Um, so Banquo says to the witches, well, you have anything to say to me? To me, you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favors nor your hate. I'm not afraid of anything you have to say. Got anything for me? And they say, lesser than Macbeth, and greater, not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. All right, you're lesser than Macbeth and you're greater. You're not as happy, but you're happier and you're going to uh, have kings as descendants, but you won't be one. Macbeth wants to know more and they vanish. Right after that, Ross and Angus come from the king and they greet Macbeth as the Thane of Cawdor. And he says, wait a minute, uh, the Thane of Cawdor, the, the, there already is a Thane of Cawdor. I can't be me. He's like, no, he's been executed. He's gone. King gives it to you. And Macbeth thinks, oh my goodness, they told the truth. And uh, Macbeth says, it says aside, like he's, he's ruminating. He just says it quietly to himself. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. I can't decide if this is good or bad. If ill, why hath it given me earnest of success commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cawdor. If, if they're bad, if they're a bad force, why did they tell me the truth? If good, 
Why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? It's making him think things that scare him. What's it making him think? I could kill the king. In fact, we're going to find out, I've thought about killing the king. I've thought about being king. And he's just, he's in a trance almost. Banquo says, look how our partner's wrapped. In other words, he's just sort of in his own little world, in his daydream. So Macbeth says uh, to Banquo, let's, let's talk about this some more later. I'm going to talk to you about what hath chanced, what just happened. Okay. Next scene, right after talking to Macbeth and greeting him as the Thane of Cawdor, we find out how the execution of the first Thane of Cawdor went. And here's what Malcolm has to say about it. My liege, they are not yet come back, the, the executioners. But I have spoke with one that saw him die who did report that very frankly he confessed his treasons, implored your highness's pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving of it. He died better than he lived. He died as one that had been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed as twere a careless trifle. He died like he had nothing left to live for, and he died repentant and clean. And Duncan says, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. It's so hard to look at a person and know whether you ought to trust him or not. I trusted him. I thought he was true blue. There, there's no way to look at a person and decide whether they're trustworthy. Right then, Macbeth walks in. No, Duncan, there's no way. You're not good at it. You're not good at it, Duncan, deciding whom to trust. Because Macbeth comes in and he completely trusts him. He says to him, I have begun to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing. I'm going to, you've got a great career with me. I'm just starting to reward you. And he tells him, I need to come stay at your house tonight. And Macbeth has a conversation with himself aside about that and one more thing. Duncan thinks, you know what? I've, there are traitors. Oh, there's war. I better name my heir. I'm naming my son Malcolm. He's Prince of Cumberland, which means the heir apparent, the next in line. And Macbeth says, the Prince of Cumberland that is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap, for in my way it lies. Shoot. I thought maybe he was going to make me Prince of Cumberland. Made his son Prince of Cumberland. That's a problem. That keeps me from being king. He says, <clears throat> The eye wink at the hand and let yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. The eye wink at the hand. Close your eyes. Do something, but I want to look. I know what I'm thinking about doing, but I don't want to look. I just want what happens next after Duncan's out of the way to happen. I want to be king, but I don't. I don't want to look. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to know what I'm considering doing, but I am considering doing it. Okay, scene five, we see Lady Macbeth. Macbeth has sent her a letter in which he has told her all about these witches and what they've promised him. And after she reads the letter, Lady Macbeth says, Gloms thou art and Cawdor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Oh, you're going to be king. Yet do I fear thy nature, it is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. I fear your nature. 
it is too full of the milk of human kindness, which by the way is a phrase Shakespeare made, first use of that, to catch the nearest way. What's the easiest way to be king? Pfft, kill the king. But Macbeth, you're too nice for that. I'm afraid you're too nice for that. She says, thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. You are ambitious, but you don't understand the down and dirty things you got to do to get there. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily. The things you want, what thou wouldst highly, you would do in the right way, that wouldst thou holily. Wouldst not play false, and yet would strongly win. You don't want to do anything technically wrong, but you still want the fruits of bad behavior. Okay. Then she says later in her speech, Hie thee hither, come here, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round. Come here. I want to whisper my little advice in your ear, chastise you and tell you, be a man, buck up and do it all that impedes thee from the golden round, everything that's keeping you from the crown. So Macbeth uh, comes home and uh, tells her he's staying here tonight. And she says, fantastic. That's just what we want. Um, he says, my dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. She says, when goes hence? tomorrow as he purposes. And she says, oh, never shall the sun that morrow see. Now, just before he comes in, she has asked the spirits that tend on mortal thoughts to unsex her. In other words, I don't want to be a woman anymore. Make me a man. Give me the cruelty, the, the violence of the temperament that men have. She says, take my, my mother's milk and switch it out for gall. Make it bitter. Fill me with cruelty. I don't want to think twice about this. I just want to do it, okay? So um, so she Macbeth says, oh, uh, Duncan's kind of going to stay here tonight. And Lady Macbeth says, oh, I hope he never leaves. If we do this right, he'll never leave. And then she says, she gives him some advice. Um, bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Pretend to be friendly, but we're not going to be friendly. Okay, and then she says, I'll take care of all the arrangements. Okay. So Duncan arrives, and poor Duncan, who, who cannot read men's hearts in their faces, also does not really read environments very well because he says this castle hath a pleasant seat the air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our senses what a nice place isn't this a nice vacation house like no duncan it's not this is not a pleasant place this is a poisonous place and lady macbeth of course comes out and greets him she's you know looking like the innocent flower. And then we go to the evening. They're having a feast. They're feasting the king because the king is visiting. But Macbeth isn't there. He's kind of hovering outside. And here's what he says at the beginning of scene seven. If it were done when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. If it were done when tis done, if everything ended after I did the murder, there's no consequences or anything, then I should just go ahead and do it. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success that but this blow might be the, the be all and the end all. It, again, if, if, the assassination of the murder could trammel up the consequence, have no consequences, and catch with his surcease, with its end, success. You do it, you're successful. 
If this blow were the be all and end all. Here, but here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. If only we didn't have to worry about eternity. But in these cases, we still have judgment here that we but teach bloody instructions, which being taught, we turn to plague the inventor. You know, even when you don't think about the afterlife, we still have judgment here. And oftentimes you do things and they have unforeseen consequences that come back to haunt you. It comes back to bite you. I wish, I wish none of that would happen. Then he says, he's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed. You don't kill your guests, you don't kill your king. Well, I guess his guest is the next thing. And as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. He's my relative, he's my king, he's my guest. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office, that his virtues will plead like angels against the deep damnation of his taking off. Everybody loves him. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other, and then Lady Macbeth interrupts him before he can see on the other side. It's like I'm jumping into a horse, but I overjumped it and landed on the other side. And what's making me jump? Ambition. What's my driving force? Ambition. I want to be king. I want to be important. I want to be great. And I've been thinking about it even before those witches showed up. Lady Macbeth comes and, and she's, he, he tells her, we will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, who would be war which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. I, I've gotten all sorts of, of favors. I've been made Dane of Cawdor. He likes me. I'm his darling because I put down the rebellion. Why not just enjoy that? Why should I, why should I risk it? And Lady Macbeth does not like this answer one bit. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Has it slept since? <sighs> From this time, such I account thy love. You don't love me. You don't love me because you won't do this. You're a coward. And he comes back and he says, Pretty peace. I dare do all that becomes a man. Who dares do more is who dares do more is none. I'm a man. And I'll act in any way fitting as a man. But men have limits. And murdering your king and your guest, that's a limit. And when you go past that limit, you're you're not a real man anymore. And she says, what beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? Why didn't you even bring it up and get my hopes up? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Oh, you're going to be even more of a man when you're king. And then she goes on, this horrible speech. Like, I'm a mother. And if I had promised to do something, I would have taken my baby and bashed its brains out before I'd, I'd go back on my promise to you. You know, she asked to not be a mom anymore. She asked not to be female anymore, not to have female sensitivities and sensibilities. And boy, she isn't. But he says, well, what if we fail? She says, screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. I've got a plan. You know, he's got guards. I'm going to get him drunk. We'll kill Duncan, smear him with their blood. Everybody will think they did it. Great. All right. So, Banquo. Next scene, act two, scene one. Um, Banquo and Fleance, Fleance, his son, uh, come to uh, visit. They're, they're outside. And uh, Banquo is tired. He's going to go to bed. And uh, he sees Macbeth before, before he goes to bed. He's like, oh, you think about those witches anymore? He's like, yeah, I, I don't know. We'll talk about them tomorrow. And Banquo goes to bed, the servants leave, and Macbeth is alone, and he sees a dagger appear in the air, like a phantom dagger. And he says, is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I, I have thee not, yet I see thee still. 
Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Are you something I can only see but not feel? Art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain? He's hallucinating. He's hallucinating. And he says, it is the bloody business which informs thus to mine eyes. He notices that the blade is pointing him the direction he should go. And he makes this fatal choice. He's going to listen to his wife. He's going to listen to ambition. He's going to listen to the witches. And a bell rings and he says, I go and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. He has made a choice. But he says, I go and it is done. And we're going to find out for the rest of the play, it's not the way it's going to work. Remember he said, if it could just be over when I do it, but it's not going to be over. There's going to be consequences. Okay. Lady Macbeth has um, gotten everything ready gotten the attendants drunk and Macbeth comes back in with bloody daggers he's done it he says I have done the deed did thou not hear a noise I heard the owl scream and crickets cry and and he thinks he heard voices saying um, Macbeth has murdered sleep sleep no more He says he wanted to pray in their drunken stupor. The, the attendants, one said, God bless us, and amen the other. And he said, I could not say amen when they did say, God bless us. He says, wherefore could I not pronounce amen? I had most need of blessing and amen stuck in my throat. I have separated myself from God's grace. I have chosen a path. Keep in mind the voices that say sleep no more. Macbeth has murdered sleep. There's not going to be a whole lot more sleep in the castle after this. So Lady Macbeth notices that he brought the daggers with him. Hello, you brought incriminating evidence. Go put them back. And he says, oh, I'm not going back. And she says to him, infirm of purpose, give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. Dead bodies, it doesn't mean anything. Um, if he do bleed, if Duncan bleeds, I'll gild the faces of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. I'll gild them with blood. I'll like, cover them like gold, gilded metal, so they will seem guilty. <sighs> She's gone, and Macbeth looks at his bloody hands, and he says, Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand no this my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine making the green one red will the ocean wash my hands no if i try to wash my hands in the ocean my hands will turn the ocean red with my guilt lady macbeth doesn't care she comes back she's like my hands are of your color but i shame to wear a heart so white you coward. They hear knocking and, and um, she says, oh, we need to get to bed. Put your pajamas on so we don't look like we've been up. But she says, oh, a little water clears us of this deed. All you got to do is rinse your hands. Nobody will know. A porter in the next scene comes to answer the door. And it's kind of a joke. He pretends that he's the porter, the doorman of hell. And it's not really a joke, is it? Because he kind of is at this point. And Macduff has come. Macduff was supposed to meet with Duncan early in the morning. And Macduff goes in to meet with him and finds his body. And, of course, Lady Macbeth comes out. And, and she, uh, uh, this is kind of ironic, Macduff says to her, O oh, gentle lady, tis not for you to hear what I can speak. The repetition in a woman's ear would murder as it fell. Now, Lady Macbeth's not much of a woman anymore. She didn't want to be feminine and gentle, and she got what she asked for. But Macduff doesn't know that. Uh, they went in and found him murdered, and then it turns out Macbeth has killed the attendants, the grooms. Of course, 
He killed them so they wouldn't talk if they know anything or saw anything. But he says he did it because he just couldn't bear to look at them. Right? Um, they ask him, why, why did you do that? And, and he says, who can be wise, amazed, temperate, and furious, loyal and neutral in a moment? Too many, too many emotions swirling around. He says, here lay Duncan, his silver skin laced with his golden blood, and there the murderers steeped in the colors of their trade, their daggers breached with gore. Who could refrain that had a heart to love? Or he's got to look like the innocent flower. Right. They go off to have a meeting, but Donald Bain and Malcolm, Duncan's sons, know something is fishy here. Something's going on, and our dad's just been murdered, and we may be next. They're taken off. They're taken off, one of them to England, one to Ireland. We're going to go get some help, and we're going to get this sorted out and find out who did this to Dad, because we don't think it was his attendants. All right. A short scene follows that, and notice we ta start talking about the weather again. You're like, why are we so into the weather? Because in Shakespeare, um, in, in Renaissance plays, weather is connected to the state. Okay, when there's disruption in the state, in the government, in society, there's disruption in the weather. And, and Ross says, uh, tells this old man, there are all sorts of weird things happened. You know, a falcon towering in her pride of place was by a mousing owl hawked at and killed. A falcon, this noble creature, got killed by an owl hunting for mice. A lower creature killed a higher creature, oddly. Ooh, I wonder what other lower creature killed a higher creature last night. Macbeth killed Duncan. Okay. In Act 3, Banquo starts the act out in Scene 1, and he's musing on everything that's happened, and he says, Thou hast it now, King, Cawdor, Gloms, all as the weird women promised, and I fear thou playedst most foully for it. Banquo has suspicions, doesn't he? Mac Macbeth has been made king. Malcolm and Donald Bain are gone. They've elected Mac Macbeth king in their place. Because now they're starting to think, oh, maybe his sons paid the grooms to do it. They did run off, you know, and running always makes you look guilty. Banquo says, hmm, you have it all, and I fear thou playedst most foully for it. But what the witches told you came true, I wonder if mine will come true. Macbeth comes in with his attendants and Lady Macbeth, and it turns out Macbeth is having a party that night, a feast, and he wants everyone to come, especially Banquo. And he questions Banquo, so where are you going? What you doing? Is Fleance your son going with you? We find out very quickly why he's questioning him on his whereabouts and his plans. But he says, oh, well, make sure, make sure not to be late. Don't be late. I don't want you to be late for the feast. He leaves, and instantly, Macbeth says to one of his slaves, attend those men our pleasure. They are, my lord, without the palace gate. Bring them before us. He's already talked to and he's getting ready to hire murderers to get rid of Banquo and Fleance. Why? He's about to tell us. To be thus is nothing. To be king is nothing. But to be safely thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep and in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. He's a good guy, he's a smart guy, not to mention the witches say his descendants are going to be king. He says, upon my head, they, the witches, placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched with a unilineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. I'm not going to have a dynasty. Apparently Banquo is going to have a dynasty. If it be so, for Banquo's issue, have I filed my mind, defiled my mind. I send for Banquo. For them, 
the gracious Duncan have I murdered. Put rancors in the vessel of my peace, only for them, and mine eternal jewel, my spirit, given to the common enemy of man, Satan, to make them kings, the seeds of Banquo kings. Well, we're going to do something about this. Remember, if it were done when it was done, but it's not, it's already not. Now I got to get rid of Banquo. So the murderers come and he sets it up. Apparently he had passed conversation with these guys. They had a grudge against Macbeth and he said, no, Banquo did that. You should have a grudge against Banquo. So I'm hiring you to go kill Banquo and make sure to get his son too. Because obviously we don't want his son to live because then his son could have children and Banquo's descendants would still be kings. So, um, Lady Macbeth opens scene two and uh, she knows something's not right. Macbeth is acting strange. He's never been the same since that night. And she says, Nought's had all spent where our desire is got without content. We wanted to be king and queen, but we're not enjoying it. Tis safer to be that which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. Our joy is doubtful. We, we don't have the joy that we thought this step would give us back when it sounded so good to be the king and queen. Macbeth comes in and she starts talking like him. She says, things without all remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. She's going with the when it's done, it's done line. Things without remedy should be without regard. If you can't fix it, don't worry about it. And he answers her, we have scorched the snake, not killed it. We've just begun. She'll, be clothed, she'll close and be herself, while our poor malice remains in danger of her former tooth. The snake, the, the can of worms we've opened up with killing, we've just started. And she, he says, you know, Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Treason has done his worst, nor steel, nor poison, malice, domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. Maybe Duncan's the lucky one. He doesn't have to deal with anything anymore. Lady Macbeth says, just put on, put on a nice show, put on a happy face. Go wash your face, put on some nice clothes. You got a party to go to, you got a feast. And he's so, oh, I will. Oh, and by the way, greet Banquo, especially tonight at the, at the feast. And then he says, oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Thou knows that Banquo and his pleons lives. Because she knows, she knows the whole story of the witches. She knows that Banquo's children are supposed to be kings. And she says, but in them nature's copies not etern. Uh, that their line can't go on forever. And he says, there's comfort yet. They are assailable. And then he tells her that there shall be done a deed of dreadful note tonight. And she says, what's to be done? Okay, she's not in on this. He's isolating himself. He doesn't even let her in on his plans. He says, be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till thou applaud the deed. She's getting nervous. All right. The murderers kill Banquo. They don't get fleance. Um, and we're back in scene four. We're back with Macbeth. Um, they're at the party at the feast. The murderer comes. He's covered in blood. And Macbeth says, there's blood upon thy face. And he says, tis Banquo's to them. "'Tis better thee without than he within. "'I'd rather have his blood on your outside than his inside.'" Is he dispatched? "'My lord, his throat is cut, that I did for him. "'Thou art the best of the cutthroats.'" <coughs> Excuse me. But Fleance escaped. Now, Macbeth is upset about that, but he's also feeling the 
tension of conscience, isn't he? Because he looks around and they say, oh, come Lord, come sit down. Oh, is there, a, is there an empty seat anywhere? Well, right here. And he looks and he sees the ghost of Banquo accusing him. And uh, he says, thou canst not say I did it. Never shake thy gory locks at me. And of course, no one else sees the ghost, including Lady Macbeth. And, and she says, what's wrong? She says, are you a man? He says, I and a bold one that dare look on that which might appall the devil. I'm looking at the ghost of the guy I just murdered. Oh, I'm tough. I'm a man. And she says, oh, proper stuff. This is the very painting of your fear. This is the air-drawn dagger, which you said led you to Duncan. You're seeing things again. You're hallucinating. But finally, he just, he won't let it go. The ghost keeps appearing. He has a complete meltdown in the middle of the feast. And um, Lady Macbeth has to tell them all to leave. Now, I want to point something out here. It's kind of interesting. Um, when uh, the scene opens and Macbeth greets them, he says, you know your own degrees. Sit down. You know your own degrees. In other words, you all know where you're supposed to sit. They have a certain, like a seating arrangement based on um, their level of nobility. All is orderly because the state is orderly. This is a well-run government where everyone knows his place, everyone knows what's supposed to happen, the ceremonial uh, etiquette. But by the end of this feast, Lady Macbeth tells them all to leave. And she says, I pray you speak not. He grows worse and worse. Question enrages him. At once, good night. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. Stand not upon the order of your going. Don't, you don't pay any attention to uh, the etiquette anymore. Just get out. Just get out before he blows the lid on everything we did. And not to mention, he's completely embarrassing me. The state is breaking down. If we're done, when tis done, but it's not. Not only is it attacking conscience, but it's attacking the government system. That night with all the storms, now, now we have no ceremony. We have no orderliness. Just stand out upon your, uh, stand out upon the order of your going. Macbeth says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to find those witches again. I will tomorrow and betimes I will to the weird sisters. More shall they speak. For now I am bent to know by the worst means the worst. For mine own good, all causes shall give way. For mine own good, all causes shall give, give way. Everything's going to get out of my way. I don't care about anything. I'm on my path and I'm following my path. For I, um, I am in blood steps in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as go o'er. It's like I'm wading through a river of blood and I'm already halfway across. There's no going back. There's no point. I might as well just wade ahead and keep on this path. Strange things I have in head that will to hand, in head which will to hand, which I'm going to do which must be acted ere they be scanned, which must be acted, done, ere they be scanned, thought about. I'm not gonna think about it and then act, I'm just gonna do it. I'll think about it later. Lady Macbeth says, you lack the season of all nature's sleep. You're not sleeping. Why, Gloms has murdered sleep. Sleep no more. And he says, come, will to sleep. My strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear that once hard use, we are yet but young indeed. We're just apprentice murderers. We'll get better at it. The witches meet again. But then we see Lennox and another lord talking about um, Macduff. And we find out that Macduff was summoned to court Macduff was summoned by Macbeth and didn't go. That's not a good sign. Um, his uh, estate is called Fife. He's the Thane of Fife. All right. 
So Macduff is now on Macbeth's bad side, and it's going to get worse. Act four, he goes to see those witches again, and they say the famous line, which you may have heard, double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn, cauldron bubble. And they're throwing in all this disgusting stuff, these disgusting ingredients, and they cool it with a baboon's blood. And then the second witch feels Macbeth. She says, by the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Open locks, whoever knocks. And Macbeth comes in and he says, I conjure you, all right? Like a formal formula for making otherworldly creatures and spirits talk to you. By that which you profess, however you come to know it, answer me. I want answers and I want them now. And the witches say, speak, demand, we'll answer. Say if thou hadst rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters. At this point, do you think Macbeth probably suspects their masters are not good? If he does, it doesn't matter because he says, call them, let me see them. You may just be the representatives of evil, I wanna see the real thing. Okay, so in the cauldron, they pour in the blood and they do all their, their spells. And the first thing, he sees three visions. The first thing he sees, it says, is an armed head. A head with a helmet. And they say, he knows thy thought. Hear his speech, but say thou not. He does, you don't need to speak to him. He knows thy thought. And here's what the armed head says. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Beware Macduff. Beware the Thane of Fife. Dismiss me enough. Okay, so he listens to the words. Okay, beware Macduff. Got it. But he doesn't think about. He's just seen a head without a body in armor. And they told him this head knows his thought. Who knows your thought? You do, don't you? Your own head knows your thought. Is it possible this head is Macbeth? He's seeing a prophecy of his end, but he's ignoring it. He only sees and hears what he wants to see and hear. And he hears, beware Macduff. Okay, got it. Second apparition, a bloody child. And it says, be bloody, bold, and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Great, because everybody is born of women. Men don't have babies. People don't just sprout out of the cabbage patch. And if no, no one born of woman shall harm me, I'm invincible. He doesn't really think about what he saw, a bloody child. He doesn't ask himself, is there any way that, that babies come that they're not born? Sometimes it's a cesarean, bloody child. But he doesn't think about that. All right, then Macbeth says, live Macduff, what need I fear of thee? If no one born of woman can harm me, then I don't need to fear anyone, but he says, I'll make assurance double sure and take a bond of fate. Thou shalt not live that I may tell pale-hearted fear it lies and sleep in spite of thunder, right? Apparently nobody can harm me, but just in case I'll kill you anyway. All right, third apparition, a child with a crown and a tree in his hand. And here's what the third apparition says, be lion metalled, in other words, have a character like a lion, be fierce and, and bold, proud, and take no care who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquished be until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. Right, Dunsinane is his castle and Burnham Wood is a forest nearby. And Macbeth says, that will never be. Who can impress the forest, bid the tree unfix his earthbound root? Trees don't march. Nobody can impress trees and make them serve in the army unless they're like tree beard. 
Nobody born a woman can harm me and trees are going to march before I can be harmed. However, he didn't look at the picture again. A child with a crown. A child. Hmm. A child. Maybe a child of Duncan? With a tree in his hand. Okay. With a branch? Okay. If you're carrying the branches, it looks like the trees are moving, but I'm not paying attention to that. Okay. Now, he has one more thing he wants to know. Has killing Banquo done the trick? He says, shall Banquo's issue ever reign in this kingdom? They don't want to tell him. He says, I will be satisfied. Deny me this and an eternal curse fall upon you. Okay, so he sees a line of eight kings and Banquo with a mirror. It's just a glass, a mirror in his hand, and it is even more kings. And they all look like Banquo. They're his descendants. And they are kings. And with a crown. He says, a horrible sight. Now I see tis true. For the blood boltered Banquo smiles upon me. And points at them for him. He's like, they're mine. They're mine. You killed me, but they're mine. The witches dance and vanish. He's not, he's not done with them, but they, they decide they're done with him. He doesn't know where they've gone to, but he asks Lennox, one of his noblemen who's attending him, where Macduff is. And he says, Macduff is fled to England. Shoot, I was going to kill him, he says. Okay. Time, thou anticipatest my dread exploits. I didn't do it fast enough. He says, because of this, from this moment, the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. The moment I decide to do it, I'm doing it. I'm not thinking it over. He says, even so, the castle of Macduff, I will surprise, seize upon Fife, give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. I'm wiping out the whole family. Which happens in the next scene. Ross tries to uh, convince Lady Macduff. You know, she thinks Macduff has just run off and left her. We're going to find out what Macduff is doing. But apparently he left without telling her the whole plan. And in his absence, uh, murderers come and they kill the entire household. Now in the next scene, we find out where Macduff really is. He's not a traitor. He hasn't run away. He never really dreamed his wife and children were in danger. He's talking to Malcolm. Malcolm, who has run off to England, Malcolm, Duncan's son. And Malcolm's a little nervous. You know, he doesn't know exactly who killed his father. He's starting to think it was Macbeth because things are looking pretty bad. But whoever it was might be out to catch him and get rid of him as well. So he can't just trust everyone who comes to him and says, I'm on your side. Or I'm against Macbeth. Let's go get him because it might be a trap. So he's got to be wary and he doesn't know if Macduff really is on Macbeth's side or on his Malcolm's side. So he tells Macduff all sorts of things about himself that I'm, I'm terrible, I'm greedy, I'm horrible, I'm lecherous, I'll go after all your wives and your daughters, everyone will hate me, you're better off with Macbeth. He doesn't mean any of it. He's just kind of baiting Macduff to see what Macduff will say to this. And Macduff says, boundless intemperance in nature is a tyranny. Boundless intemperance, no self-control in nature is a tyranny. When you don't control yourself, when you don't put limits on what you want, what you do, it's like having a tyrant in your very own soul. So when Macbeth uh, earlier says, uh, I'll do whatever becomes a man who dares do more is none. Macduff is saying, you have to put limits on what you do. That was a time when Macbeth was there too. He, he acknowledged that. But he crossed the line. And he's becoming less and less of a man all the time. He's turning into a, an animal. So Macduff convinces Malcolm that they're on the same side. 
and Malcolm agrees to march on England. The King of England has offered to give them um, military backing to go take the throne back. The King of England at this time is Edward, known as Edward the Confessor. He was known as being particularly holy and devout. And in the middle of this scene, there's a picture of, of uh, Edward the Confessor. Come, pe Sick people come to him and he heals them. It says, um, with this strange virtue, he hath a heavenly gift of prophecy and sundry blessings hang about his throne that speak him full of grace. Unlike the King of Scotland, the King of England is sort of a conduit for God's grace and mercy and healing. The King of Scotland right now is just sort of an evil beast. Now, while Macduff is talking to Malcolm, Ross, cames, Ross comes and he delivers some very bad news. Macduff, your wife and children are all dead. Macduff is horrified as you would think he would be. But Malcolm says, dispute it like a man. He might mean overcome your emotions so that we can act on this. He might mean go and fight like a man, fight for your wife and children. He says, I shall do so, but I must also feel it as a man. You know, unlike Lady Macbeth's view of manhood and womanhood, men feel. They don't just act. She never really wanted to become a man. She wanted to become a monster. Because she didn't want to feel anymore. He says, I cannot but remember such things were that were most precious to me. Malcolm says, we can use this. He said, be this the wet stone of your sword. Let grief convert to anger. Blunt not the heart, enrage it. Use this. You can use what you're feeling right now to your advantage. This man is a tyrant and he needs to be removed. And you've got as good a reason as anyone to remove him. Use your feelings, okay? So, they're planning an invasion of Scotland with English help. Now, in Act 5, we go back to Dunsinane, to Macbeth's castle. Things are not good there. Lady Macbeth has taken up sleepwalking. Do you remember what she does when she sleepwalks? She washes her hands. Remember she said a little water clears us of this deed? It doesn't. And she uh, gives her you know, famous, famous uh, speech. Out, damn spot, out I say. One, two, why then tis time to do it. She's counting on the clock. Hell is murky. Fie, my lord, fie, a soldier, and feared? What need we fear, who knows it, when none can call our power to account? Yet yeah, who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Right? She has completely become deranged with guilt. She goes on, the Thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? <gasps> Will these hands never be clean? She's reliving the murder. She's reliving what Macbeth has done. And um, her serving woman has, is showing the doctor. And the doctor says, uh, this disease is beyond my practice. Um, he says, uh, she, needs, she needs spiritual help. He says, more needs she the divine than the physician. She needs a priest. I can't help what ails her. And now, and we've both actually just heard her confess to the murder of Duncan and the murder of Macduff's family. So the doctor says, you've heard what you shouldn't to the lady in waiting. We know more than we should. But everything's falling apart. It doesn't really matter at this point. Everything's falling apart for Macbeth. The state is falling apart. Stand not upon the order of your going. There, there is no order or etiquette anymore. So Macbeth is getting ready. Um, well, I guess let's go to scene two first. Uh, the invaders are approaching. Angus says, now does he feel his secret murder sticking on his hands? Oh, that if it were done when it was done, oh, but he's living through the consequences right now. 
And he says, uh, we'll march on. And in scene three, Macbeth's waiting for him. He's talking to the doctor. <clears throat> and uh, he, Macbeth at the beginning of the scene, he's not afraid at all. He says, bring me no more reports. Let them fly all. Till Burnham Wood removed to Dunsinane, I cannot take with fear. fear. What's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of a woman? Okay, Malcolm can't hurt me. He was born of a woman and the forest didn't move him. I'm fine. And a servant comes in to give him some news. And he kind of abuses the servant because the servant's all gone pale. He's, he's so frightened. He's pale. And, uh, fine, just a second. Oh, he's worried because the English are coming. Macbeth's like, yeah, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of anything. Nobody can hurt me. Next messenger comes in. Message from the doctor. Uh, your wife is beyond help. He says, the doctor says, therein must the patient must minister to himself when things weigh upon your heart, your conscience, your spirit. The patient must minister to himself. I can't do anything for her. And the doctor says, at the end, I just want to get out of here. This is a hell hole. I want out. All right. Next scene. Um, Malcolm is at the edge of the wood of Burnham. And he says, let every soldier hew him down a bough and bear it before him, carry a branch. Thereby we shall shadow the numbers of our host. He won't know how many of us there are if we're all sheltered behind these branches. All right, can you imagine what that's gonna look like? A forest marching? Scenes, I hope you can get a feeling. The scenes go back and forth really fast here. Women are crying out, and they come and say the queen is dead. Lady Macbeth is dead. Apparently she has committed suicide. And here's what Macbeth has to say. <clears throat> she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Well, she was going to die eventually. Or he might mean, I wish she'd waited a little bit, bit longer. This is an inconvenient time. Either way, he's not too broke up about it. And then he says this, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That's what life is to Macbeth. As so much Shakespeare says life is. That's what a murderer says life is. We're all just on the way to death. We come out, we're like actors on a stage, we do our little part and we leave. Life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Life has no meaning. Macbeth's life doesn't have any meaning anymore. So a messenger comes in right after that with the strangest report. He says, as I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham, and anon me thought the wood began to move. Uh-oh. Macbeth, like, no, that can't be. Oh, yes. So... He says, all right, I'm going out to meet him. I'm going to get my armor on. He says, ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come rack. At least we'll die with harness on our back. All right, very short scene after that. They're close. Malcolm says, throw down your swords, or I'm sorry, throw down your branches, grab your swords, let's attack. And now the rest of it just goes very fast. Macbeth is out there. And he's, he's looking for people. And he finds young Seward. Seward is the son of the, um, the king of England. And he dies. 
in Donald with Macbeth. And Macbeth's like, yeah, I knew you would because you're born of a woman. Macduff comes in. And he says, tyrant, show your face. But Macbeth has run off. He's got to chase him. Meanwhile, the men are entering the castles, what, castle while Macduff is off chasing Macbeth. Macduff finds him and says, turn, hellhound, turn. Macbeth says, of all men else, I have avoided thee. Why? Well, because beware of Macduff, okay? But get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. I have already, I have already killed too much of your family. And he says, you know, you need to just back off, Macduff, because you can't hurt me. I bear a charmed life, which must not yield to one of woman born. Macduff says, despair thy charm, and let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee. Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. I was a C-section. I wasn't born. Ah, oh, and Macbeth says, accursed be that tongue that tells me so for it hath cowed my better part of man. And be these jungle, juggling fiends, the witches, no more believed, that palter with us in a double sense, that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. I'll not fight with thee. Like, uh oh, uh, the witches have been double talking me and leading me astray, I'm not fighting. And then he says, well, yield. You're going to have to just yield yourself to my mercy. And he's like, I won't. I won't. Right. They fight and Macbeth is killed. Malcolm marches in. They find out Seward is, um, uh, young Seward is uh, killed. His father says, did he have his wounds before or was he running away? Well, then he was a valiant soldier and he died in a valiant cause. Macduff comes in with Macbeth's head. Malcolm is made King of Scotland and this, the whole government is gonna be put right again under the right king. He says, um, they're going to meet at Scone uh, all of what needful else that calls us, by the grace of God, grace of grace, we will perform in measure, time, and place. So thanks to all at once and to each one whom we invite to see us crowned as gone. Each thing, measure, time, and place. I'm going to put things back together. I'm going to put things in the order, in the way things are supposed to be done. But it's going to take time. All right, that is the play Macbeth. I'm sure you can probably guess. I'll let you think about it in a minute. If we had to pick a flaw, a character flaw in Macbeth himself and say why, uh, what led him to his downfall? Could you pick one, do you think? What is there about him that leads him down this path? My guess is ambition. Macbeth is ambitious. And the witches dangle something out there, dangle a sort of half promise, you will be king. And lead him actually to do the acts that make him king. But they're evil acts and they ruin his life. They never lied, he did become king. They didn't force him to kill Duncan. But they did bait him. But you know, only creatures who want the bait fall for the bait, right? You don't bait mouse traps with lettuce leaves. I don't know, maybe mice would eat lettuce leaves. You bait them with cheese, peanut butter also works, because you bait it with something they want. And in this case, the witches baited the trap with honors, privilege, and uh, offices of state, because they knew Macbeth wanted them. All right. There's probably much more we could say about Macbeth. I hope you enjoyed it. I encourage you to watch Macbeth. When the libraries open again, uh, there is a, the BBC plays have a, uh, 
a copy of Macbeth. It's pretty good. Lady Macbeth's a little uh, but um, some versions of Macbeth that have been turned into movies are a little violent. Okay, so I would discourage you from watching those. But I will send out a link to uh, a copy of it on Amazon or something. Um, but I know that the library system has it. I know the East Moline Library has them. I think the Rock Island Library has them. So you could get them from the library system. But I urge you to watch it because these plays are not meant to be read. They are meant to be seen. They're not literature. They're plays. The last thing we're going to read together is one of Shakespeare's history plays, Henry V. Now, I'm going to ask you to read Acts 1, 2, and 3 this week, not the whole play, but I do need to tell you some background information, okay? Because Henry V is the fourth play of a four-play set. It was Richard II, Henry IV Part 1, Henry IV Part 2, and Henry V. Okay, so let me tell you some background. Richard II, I'm going to tell you the actual history, okay? Richard II was a king, made king when he was very, very young. He was the grandson of um, Edward III. His dad was Edward the Black Prince of Wales, who was famous in the Hundred Years' War. Edward the Black Prince died and Richard was made king. And as often happens when a king becomes king very young, he has advisors, uncles and, and, and people like that, that advise him not according to, to what's best for the king, but what's best for them. And this happened to Richard. And so, uh, he surrounded himself with uh, friends who led him astray. He was a bit of a, not partier exactly, but he was just more concerned with his friends. And uh, eventually he decided he wanted to turn against the, uh, the noblemen, the uncles and the noblemen who'd been uh, railroading him, who'd been telling him what policy to follow. So when he grew up, he, he worked on that, and it, it, power struggle went back and forth a bit. But eventually, he ended up banishing um, a man, uh, Henry the Fourth. He's going to be Henry the Fourth. He was named Henry Bolingbroke. He was a cousin of Richard II's. He, he was of the nobility. And Henry Bolingbroke had been about to have a, a duel uh, for honor with someone, and, and Richard II was disgusted with it, and he banished both of them. So Henry Bolingbroke was banished in France, and while he was in France, his dad died. And instead of notifying Henry Bolingbroke that he had lands and estates there and that when he came back from banishment, he could have them, Richard II just took the lands. He just took it all. Henry Bolingbroke did not take this well, and neither did a lot of the noblemen in England. They thought that was a terrible thing to do. So Henry came back with an army from France, and uh, the people who were on his side in this disagreement joined him. And it ended up happening that Henry Bolingbroke overthrew Richard II and took the crown for himself. Now, he was in the royal family, like I said, but it was taken by force. Richard II was imprisoned, but he did not live very long in prison, not more than a couple of years. And many people suspected that Henry Bolingbroke had him killed. Henry took the title Henry IV as king. Okay. So that is the background to the history. Henry V is the son of Henry IV. Now, let's talk about the Shakespeare version of Henry IV. In the Shakespeare version, in, in reality too, he had a son um, who's also named Henry. They call him Prince Hal as a nickname. In the Shakespeare plays, Prince Hal is a party boy. He rebels against his dad, as so many young people do if they have a, a parent in some place of honor and they don't want to be associated with that, so they, they rebel against the parent. Prince Hal spends his time hanging out with a group of thieves and low lives in bars. The chief thief is a man named Sir John Falstaff. He's big, he's fat, he's jolly, he drinks a lot, and um, he's sort of a general all-around good guy except for the stealing. They're mostly pickpockets. I mean, they're not like horrible highwaymen 
killing people, but they are thieves. There's several other thieves he hangs out with. A group of guys, one is named Bardolph, one is named Nim, and one is named Pistol. As you can tell, Pistol has quite a temper. His name's Pistol. Prince Hal hangs out with them and they're best buddies in Henry IV Part One and Henry IV Part Two until we get to the end of Henry IV Part Two. And at the very end, Henry IV has died and Prince Hal is now becoming the new king, King Henry V. And everybody thinks he's going to be a terrible king because he's been this loser, Prince Hal, that hangs out in bars all the time and with a bunch of thieves. But he makes a complete turnaround the minute he's king. He becomes responsible and dutiful. He does everything the right way. And I know I got to look this up just a second. Let me grab my, oh, my huge complete works of Shakespeare. Um, so at the end of Henry IV, too. Prince Hal has become king. He's Henry V. And Sir John Falstaff, who was his best friend, like the guy thought of Prince Hal as a son. He, he comes and he presents himself to the king. You know, the king's marching by in state. And Falstaff shouts out, God save thy grace, King Hal, my royal Hal. And Pistol shouts out, the heavens thee guard and keep, most royal imp of fame. And the king says, my lord chief justice, speak to that vain man. And the chief justice, have you your wits? Know you what tis you speak? Hey, you're talking to the king. Show a little respect. And Falstaff says, my king, I speak to thee, my heart. Hal, Hal. And Henry says, I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a fool and jester. I have long dreamt of such a kind of man. It was like a dream. We used to hang out. So surfeit swelled, so old and so profane. But being awaked, I do despise my dream. Make thy let make less thy body hints and more thy grace. And he and he chews him out. And and Falstaff can't believe it. He's like, no, no, he he has to say this in public. He just he just has to say this in public. He can't mean it. It's he he's gotta put on a show, but he'll call for me. He'll call for me later. And Bardolph and Nim and Pistol, he'll call for all of us and we'll, we'll be happy together like we used to be. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He's king now. And he's got to be king. Now, the actual historical Henry V wasn't like this. He was actually a well-trained soldier and a good guy and he fought by his dad's side. But in the Shakespeare version, this is what's happened in the plays before. You need to know this as you read Henry V. Bardolph and Nim and Pistol, and there's a lady named Nell Quickly, Mistress Quickly. He used to hang out at her bar with them. You meet them in Henry V. And when you first meet them, you find out that Sir John Falstaff is on his deathbed. He's grieving. And they say, the king hath killed his heart. All right. Now, one other thing you need to know before you start reading. The very beginning of the play is a little hard to follow. Please do not give up. Stick with it. All right. And again, this is available free online. I should tell you that. You might have a copy of it at home. If you do, it would be great if it has footnotes. Uh, you can also get it very cheaply and load it onto your Kindle or a tablet. Um, but as you begin, it's, and if you don't have footnotes to follow, it's a little bit hard to follow. When you begin, there are some churchmen. And what they're talking about in the very first scene is that there's a bill in Parliament to tax the church heavily. It's going to raise the taxes, and it's really going to cut into their income. What are they going to do about it? Oh, 
Well, I talked to the king and I told him we'd give him a bunch of money if he'd renew his wars in France. Remember, this is during the Hundred Years' War, England versus France. We told him that we would back him financially if he would just drop that bill, just bury that bill that's going to tax us. So right at the beginning of the play, we wonder what the motivation of the church is in backing this. Do they really think he should go fight? Or are they just kind of covering their own tracks to get rid of a law that would potentially hurt them financially? All right. And then there's also a scene where a man gives a big long speech about why Henry has a valid claim to the French throne. Don't even try to follow. I mean, you can read it, but don't worry that you can't follow it. The point is it's a convoluted speech. So don't, don't worry, all right, if you can't completely follow it. Read the best you can. We're going to talk about it scene by scene next week and the next week. But next week, please read Acts 1, 2, and 3. And you know, if you're stumbling over a part and you just want to call me and talk about it for a while, please call. I would love to talk about Henry V. All right? Till then, get a copy of Henry V, read the first three Acts, do your best, follow the best you can, and I will go over it next week. Till then, I'll see you. Bye-bye.